afternoon and welcome to NASA's Stennis Space Center in Mississippi. We are bringing you live coverage as Artemis fires up for today's Green Run test, a major milestone on America's mission to land the first woman and the next man on the moon with the Artemis program. Good evening, I'm Lee D'Angelo. And just a little over a mile behind me is the historic D-Test complex where NASA tested rocket stages for the mighty Saturn V rocket and the space shuttle. Today, in just about 30 minutes, we will test the core stage of our new space launch system rocket, also known as the SLS. What you see behind me mounted into the B-2 test stand is the most powerful core stage in the world. This SLS rocket is set to make its first flight from NASA's Kennedy Space Center later this year on the Artemis I mission, which will send an uncrewed Orion spacecraft beyond the moon and back to Earth. We're going to learn a lot more about Artemis, SLS, the core stage, and today's test, which we call the Green Run Hot Fire. We'll also be talking with NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine, hearing from some of those who have made this all happen and getting a unique perspective from someone who knows how it feels to ride a rocket into space, astronaut Tracy Caldwell Dyson. We also want to hear from you, and for that we have Apollonia Acker standing by to help you connect on social media. Apollonia? Hi, I'm Apollonia Acker. I'm social media coordinator with the communications teams here at Stennis Space Center and today I'm bringing your comments live to NASA TV and we're glad to have you following along on all of our social media platforms we also invite you to follow us at NASA Artemis on Twitter and we are live on Facebook Instagram LinkedIn Theta TV daily motion and twitch we're going to be sharing some of your posts so submit your questions and your posts using hashtag ask NASA also, we've been asking you, what would you take on a trip to the moon in celebration of today's hot fire test? And you've submitted your moon kits using hashtag NASA moon kit. We're going to be tracking your reaction online, and I'm just excited to see this in person. Back to you, Lee. Thanks so much, Apollonia. And I'm so glad we get to share this event online. We might normally have hundreds of folks on hand here to see this in person. But of course, we're following COVID protocols for social distancing. Those of us who are here are looking forward to some fire and smoke and a lot of noise. I've got Alex Cagnola here with me. He's a core stage engineer who can tell us about the test. Alex, thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely, thank you for having me. I wanna start with the basics. What is the core stage? How does it fit into SLS? Well, the core stage is really the powerhouse of our entire space launch system. Um, the core stage has two propellant tanks, one of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen four RS-25 engines, uh, more than 18 miles of cables, all of our electronics, avionics boxes, everything we consider the brains of the rocket, and of course all the plumbing that goes into feeding our fuel to our four RS-25 engines. Sounds pretty big. Yeah, it's very big. You know, our core stage is 212 feet long, um, you know, the most powerful core stage ever built, so we're super excited to see it be tested today. So we're testing today. We're not showing. This isn't a demonstration. What does a successful test look like? Right, and that's very important to remember, you know, we'll be testing the rocket. We're still, you know, learning things about our rocket as we, as we further test. So, you know, you, you, we might hear some test conductor audio interrupt our talk, and we'll be relaying that message to everybody. Um, you know, we might fire a few minutes before or a few minutes after our scheduled time. Um, you know, we're really looking to get some engineering data once we do ignite all four engines. Um, and that may include, you know, moving the engines a little bit or throttling up or throttling down. You know, we're going to be testing everything we can to get all the data we need. You're the expert. I'm glad you're here with us. I'm going to have a lot of questions for you throughout the show. So thank you again. And we're getting set to chat with NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstein about the Artemis program. But first, let's hear this message from Stennis Director Rick Gilbreck. Hello, I'm Rick Gilbreck, Director of Stennis Space Center, and I wanted to welcome you to today's Green Run. I'm here at the base of the B-2 test stand where you can see the Space Launch System core stage installed in the stand. That very stage will roar to life today, producing over 2 million pounds of thrust for what we hope to be a 500 second full duration hot fire. The SLS was designed at Marshall Space Flight Center, was assembled just down the road at the Mishu Assembly Facility by Boeing, is powered 
by four Rocketdyne RS-25 engines, and today we will do our part to verify it for flight. I'm always humbled and feel blessed to lead such a talented Stennis workforce, and also to be associated with all the talented folks in the SLS program. I'm proud of them, and you should be too. The men and women of NASA, Boeing, and Aerojet Rocketdyne have worked to make this green run a reality. They've overcome many, many challenges, especially this year with COVID, with a busy hurricane season, and a lot of technical issues that they've all overcome and persevered to make today possible. Personally for me, this will be the highlight of my 29 year NASA career. I became hooked on NASA at the ripe old age of seven when Neil Armstrong stepped on the moon for the first time in 1969. Well, guess what? We're gonna make history again today and I'm glad you're here to share it with me. Welcome to the Artemis generation. We are go for Green Run. We've shown you a little bit about what we're doing today, but now let's talk about why. Joining us for that is NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine. Jim, welcome to Mississippi. Well, thank you, Lee. It's great to be here. I want to start with the overall picture. Talk to me about the Artemis program. Well, we're going to the moon. Uh, this time we're doing it unlike we've ever done before. We're going with commercial partners. We're going with international partners. We're going to learn how to live and work on another world for long periods of time using the resources of the other world. We're going to use the resources of the moon to live and work with a purpose because ultimately we want to go to Mars. So we're going to build the capacity uh, to live and work on another world so that we can go to Mars. And the reason we have to do that Mars and Earth are aligned on the same side of the sun once every 26 months. So when you go to Mars, once you're there, it takes about nine months to get there, once you're there, you have to be willing to stay as it orbits the sun until Earth and Mars are aligned again. The moon is always with the Earth wherever we are around the sun, so it's, it's the perfect proving ground. And of course, there's tons of science we can get from the moon. We can get um, a lot of information of the early solar system uh, because of the subatomic charged particles that have been coming from the sun for billions of years and impacting the moon uh, that we can't get from here on Earth because we have a magnetosphere that protects the Earth and, and an active geology and an active atmosphere and a hydrosphere. Uh, so, so the moon is a lot about science and data. It's about the early solar system. It's also about astrophysics, looking deeper into space than ever before because the moon gives us an opportunity uh, to, to really to have this very quiet area from an electromagnetic spectrum perspective, very quiet area on the far side of the moon where we can look way out into deep space and in fact look back into time, if you can imagine that. So we're going to the moon sustainably, we're going for science, discovery, exploration, but we're also going as a proving ground so that we can go to Mars. It sounds like you're excited about this all the time, <laughs> uh, not yes. just today, but let's bring it back to Earth. Actually a little bit closer, just a mile away. Talk to me about SLS and how unique this is. So the SLS rocket is the most powerful rocket ever built in the history of humanity. Uh, the core stage has far, uh, four RS-25 engines. These are very similar to the space shuttle main engines. Um, and of course, we're gonna light this rocket today for a period of eight minutes which is the amount of time we're gonna to need to, 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 to light it for a launch. So what we're doing today is we are replicating as much as possible a launch. And we have to remember that, that what we're testing today, this is a test vehicle, it's also the flight hardware. This is the same rocket that by the end of this year will be launching the Orion crew capsule around the moon. Now by the end of this year, that Orion crew capsule will be uncrewed when it goes around the moon. But by 2023, we're gonna send American astronauts around the moon, and by 2024, we're gonna be landing on the moon. Well, thank you so much, Administrator Bridenstine. I'm sure you wanna get somewhere a little warmer where you'll be able to watch the test. Great to be with you. It's great to be with you too, thank you so much. It was just a few weeks ago that we announced uh, the astronauts for the Artemis program. Let's take a look and meet those astronauts right now. At NASA, we have always answered the innate call to go. With Artemis, we are going to stay. Proving that humanity can live on the moon, Mars, and other worlds. And share the wonders of the solar system with all. Our story is one of people. All those who make this journey possible. 
from advocates across communities to companies across industries to countries around the world we achieve this collective endeavor our efforts create impact for all technologies that revolutionize industries and jobs that bring prosperity to people the discoveries from space benefit the way we live on earth today and those from the moon will create a better future for generations to come but to do that we must go hi i'm chell ingram my name is raja chari kayla baron kate rubens hi i'm christina cook nasa astronaut joe acaba Jessica Meir, Woody Hoberg, Anne McLean, Stephanie Wilson. My name is Johnny Kim. Nicole Mann. Victor Glover. Jessica Watkins. Hi, I'm Matthew Dominic. Jasmine Mogbelli. Frank Rubio. Scott Tingle. This is what we do. This is what we will do. Let's go. Go to the moon to learn how to live on other planets. For the benefit of all. If you are just joining us, welcome. The engines on the SLS core stage are expected to fire up at 4 o'clock Eastern, 3 o'clock local here at Stennis Space Center. Before that happens, let's get a closer look at the space launch system. NASA's Space Launch System is Artemis' super heavy lift rocket and provides the foundation for human exploration and scientific missions to the moon, Mars, and beyond. Powered by two solid rocket boosters and four RS-25 engines, this rocket provides unprecedented power and capability. Designed to reach 23 times the speed of sound and an altitude of more than 100 miles in just over eight minutes. Offering more energy, volume capacity, and payload mass than any rocket built today. Under the launch abort system, Orion and the upper stage and between two solid rocket boosters is the heart of every SLS configuration, the core stage. Towering 212 feet with a diameter of 27.6 feet and storing 537,000 gallons of liquid hydrogen and 196,000 gallons of liquid oxygen. This is the world's largest core stage ever built. The core stage for Artemis 1 fires up for the first time at NASA's historic V2 test stand. So there it is, the Artemis 1 SLS core stage on the B2 test stand. The teams on site are planning to fire up those four RS-25 engines at 4 o'clock Eastern. Now, Alex, I know this is a culmination of tests here, but it started way long ago. Let's just go back one step you know, and talk to me about how this was built and assembled at Michoud Assembly Facility. Absolutely. You know, so originally the core stage was designed um, up in Huntsville by our SLS program team and also our Boeing team. Um, and then, you know, manufacturing began at Michoud Assembly Facility in New Orleans. Uh, it's our state-of-the-art manufacturing rocket facility. Um, it's more than 44 acres under a single roof. Um, and obviously through the production of that rocket, uh, we eventually moved the core stage um, from Michoud Assembly Facility here. Um, you know, that process is no easy feat, you know. Um, a lot of coordination at Michoud uh, to be able to ship that thing and, and get it here in, in, in the proper amount of time. And so you're talking about moving a rocket on the Mississippi River. Right. Yeah. So, you know, we have a barge called the Pegasus barge and this barge is um, it's kind of our carrier for the core stage. You know, it's 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 a fully covered barge, um, you know, and, and it carries our core stage all across the Mississippi and eventually to Kennedy Space Center. And then when it lands here, how do you get it into the test stand? So whenever the core stage does arrive to send us, um, you know, we have a very talented and very experienced lift team and, you know, they bring the core stage to the sand. Um, they lift the core stage in a very slow process and lower it into the B2 test stand, secure it, uh, and then we begin our rounds of testing. Your rounds of testing, what does that look like? Well, we actually have a series of green run testing. You know, this is actually the eighth test in a, in a full series of green run tests that we've been performing over this past year. Um, you know, we start with modal testing, which is kind of testing the vibrations and the structure of the rocket to see how it's going to react um, when we do do the hot fire. And then we do things like powering on the avionics, all the electronics equipment, and then we move into activating safety systems, you know, testing NPS components, and kind of piece, piece by piece building on what we previously did 
to finally get to the point where we are today. And today we call it the Green Run Hot Fire Test. Why is it called the Green Run? Well, the Green Run really um, refers to the parts in the rocket never being flown before. So, you know, obviously all these parts have been tested um, by themselves, but they've never really been tested as one giant unit. Um, so today we're really looking to get all that data and, and fire and fire for the first time. Um, and then obviously the run refers to all the series of tests we've done to get to this point. Well, Alex, thank you so much. Again, we're going to be coming back to you. We're also, uh, later on in the show, going to start hearing some audio from the control room, so I'm going to be relying on you, Alex, to let us know what they are talking about. And the hottest part of the show today will be those four RS-25 engines at the bottom of the core stage. An interesting fact, these RS-25s we're testing today are repurposed from the shuttle program. These four engines flew on some pretty iconic shuttle missions, including one of the Hubble Space Telescope servicing missions, the historic return to space of Mercury astronaut Senator John Glenn, six flights to the space station, and the final space shuttle mission in 2011. So you can trace a direct line from that final shuttle flight to the first flight of SLS. We've worked with our partners at Aerojet Rocketdyne to upgrade the 16 shuttle main engines, which will power the first four Artemis flights. And now we're building 24 new engines using 3D printing and other manufacturing innovations to reduce cost, complexity, and manufacturing time. And a reminder, the test teams here are looking at 3 o'clock Central, 4 o'clock Eastern for today's hot fire test. Of course, many of the teams who worked so hard for this day can't be here in person because of social distancing, but they are still cheering us on virtually. Hello, I'm Terrence Jones, Human Resource Business Partner at Stennis Space Center, America's largest rocket engine test complex. We're so excited for our Green Run test team at the historic B2 test stand. We are go for Green Run, go Artemis, go SLS. The Arrogate Rocket Dyn RX-25 engine team is extremely excited to show the world what our hardworking team has been able to accomplish. Our team is working tirelessly to build reliable engines to ensure the future of human exploration beyond Earth's orbit. Let's go back to the moon. Go Aerojet Rocket Dyn, go NASA, go Artemis 1. We are Boeing. And we are so proud to be part of Team Artemis. All right, guys, let's light it up. It's so great to see the team cheering us on for this historic event. And you guys have been cheering us on online also. And in celebration of being one step closer to landing astronauts on the moon, we've been asking you, what would you take on a trip to the moon? Let's take a look at some of the entries that we've received. We have an entry from the New Orleans Saints. And Marcus Davenport from the New Orleans Saints, he would pack his helmet and a football. What is a trip to the moon without a helmet and a football? Who that? We also have an entry here, a moon kit from Storm Lake Elementary STEM. It's great to see the little ones packing their moon kits. Storm Lake says that our moon mission is back on track. Students K through one are preparing to blast off next week by packing their moon kits. And in their moon kits, they have a soccer ball, an astronaut suit, shades, and a camera. You never know if it's gonna get bright out there. Good job, we love your moon kits. And how exciting is this? We have an entry from the one and only Marie Kondo. Let's take a look at Marine's moon kit. She is packing a blanket because she gets cold. I could use that right now. She has boxes to keep things tidy. She knows how to pack. And she also has a picture of her family because they spark her the most joy. Awesome. And in responses to what would you take to the moon, we've received some really creative entries. Let's take a look at some more of those entries that we've received. I'm really excited to see some more of these. Wow, it is absolutely incredible to see all of the moon kits that you guys have submitted. We literally have them from all over the world and I'm being asked, what would I pack in my moon kit? 
In my moon kit, I would pack my Pomeranian Azania, and I would have a pretty big box so I could squeeze my three boys and my husband in my moon kit. What about you, Lee? What would you pack? Ab, you're absolutely right. I'm not leaving Earth without my German short hair pointer, Penny. And when I told my husband that, he was upset that I didn't say I was bringing him and my sister, Casey, as well. So we're just turning the moon into a family vacation. We've been telling you a lot about the hardware we're testing today, but none of this is possible without the thousands of people at NASA, Boeing, Aerojet, Rocketdyne, and the companies around the country working hard through the coronavirus pandemic and multiple hurricanes to get to this day. From here at Stennis, where we test, to the Michoud Assembly Facility in my hometown, New Orleans, where we build, to our Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, where it all began. There is so much going on behind the scenes. Here's a look at Marshall's Software Integration Lab, which represents the brains inside SLS. I am the lead of the team that is building and testing the core stage, all the boxes you see here and, all, and the miles of cables that you see. This is what the inside of the core stage looks like. Um, so you can see it's very complex. And what we do here is we run a lot of simulations to ensure that we have validated the systems and integrated them together. So we actually have special software that's a version of the flight software, but it's really specific for our green run test. And so that testing has also been integrated into this laboratory and with all these avionics boxes to ensure we have a successful hot fire. The best part of the job is working with all the people and the teamwork. Um, it's been extremely fun to watch how everybody has pulled together with the same goal in mind. Uh, we have more than a thousand companies across the United States that support us. Some of them are small mom and pop shops all the way up to the big contractors. And each one of the individuals that have been working with us have a significant contribution and they will be, should be extremely proud, not only when we do our green run hot fire, but when we have our first Artemis mission launch. If you're just joining us today, we are live at NASA's Stennis Space Center in Mississippi for the Green Run Hot Fire Test of the core stage of our Space Launch System rocket. At about 4 o'clock Eastern, over there at our historic B-2 test stand, we are going to fire four RS-25 engines for up to eight minutes to prove this rocket is ready to launch later this year on the first Artemis mission to the moon. Again, so many people have worked to get us to this day, and even if they're not here in person, they are ready for this big milestone. On behalf of all of NASA employees and NASA contractors at the Michoud Assembly Facility, home of America's Rocket Factory, we wanted to show our appreciation to everyone supporting the Green Run Hot Fire. We are with you, and together we are making history. <laughs> My name is Preston Jones from NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. I'd like to say congratulations to the SLS team, to the core stage team for this great uh, milestone achievement. Uh, as we go into Green Run, let's say go Green Run. Go Green Run! From everyone here on Team SLS, we want to wish Spinner and everyone down there at the B2 test stand a happy and successful Green Run. Go Green Run and SLS! We have an update for you. Again, this is a live show. We are hearing what you're hearing and we are learning as we are moving through this day of test. Alex, do you have any update for us on why um, we might be possibly going faster or slower or what this is like right now? Yeah, so our test conductor um, just alerted us that they're working through a few issues on the stand. Um, you know, like we said, this is a test, so we will see some delays or some possibly, you know, some issues that we'll have to work through. It's all part of testing. So as we get more information in, we'll, we'll tell everyone and we'll work through it. 
And we did talk about this. This is a test. This is not a demonstration. Why is it so important to test today? Right. I mean, the whole point, right, is this is not a demonstration flight. You know, we're out here to test a rocket, learn as much as we can, and that'll really not only help us for the first Artemis mission, but for all of our future Artemis missions as well. And so what are we actually learning? We've got a lot of different components, a lot of different pieces of the rocket that we're looking at. What do these tests really look like? Well, we're really here to simulate almost what a launch would be like, right? The whole core stage um, with the computers and everything, it thinks that it's going to be launched. Even though we're holding it in place and testing it, we're basically going to put it through a uh, round of testing that's going to simulate the launch. So um, the whole point is to make sure, one, to verify that the core stage can perform that way, and two, get the data that we will need uh, for launch day. You've touched on this, but how much do uh, the NASA engineers really not know about this rocket? What are you really learning, and what are you just guessing or, or finding between the, d the data points you're already uh, guessing? Well, obviously our team, you know, is, is knows a lot about the rocket. You know, they've been part of this project for a long time, um, everywhere from, you know, the beginning of the production to designing the rocket to testing the rocket. You know, they've been part of every step along the way. Um, but even then, you know, you're constantly still learning, and that's, and that's part of the whole process. Um, that's part of the process with any new rocket. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's why Green Run is so important to us and so important to the team uh, and so important to the future of the Artemis mission. We've heard you describe the rocket almost like a human. We learned about the brains of SLS. Um, you talked about breathing, so there's parts of the rocket that can actually move as the test goes forward today. Is that right? Right. Yeah. A lot of people don't realize this. We you know we're pumping all that propellant into the into the core stage. You know, and that's really really cold. You know, you're talking about a lot of changing temperatures when you're hot firing the engine. I um, mean, you'll have a lot of parts that'll be moving, not just you know tanks shrinking and growing um, by a few inches just because of that temperature change so you know it's almost like a like a breathing human being you know you'll, you'll when you when you turn it on it'll actually feel like you know it's rumbling you'll hear it you'll see it uh, and it'll be super exciting so when you turn the rocket on that's got to be harder than just turning your car on at home what's that like right absolutely you know we actually started um, vehicle power on a few days ago and you, you, you slowly turn on individual avionics boxes um, and then you have to charge the batteries, right? And so you're, you're slowly turning it on one by one and doing verifications of each system as you do turn it on, um, finally to the point where you have one large core stage working all together uh, simultaneously. Simultaneously. And you talked about temperature changes. Can you describe the changes that the engines will go through today? Right, absolutely. So the fuel that we're um, adding to the core stage, right, that's our liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. Um, both fuels are very, very cold. You know, you, they have to be very cold to be in liquid form and not in their natural gas state. So, you know, we're looking at temperatures uh, negative 400 degrees, you know, a little bit more than negative 300 degrees um, for those two propellants. And then when it comes time for ignition, you know, in, in less than a second, you know, we're getting up to a few thousand degrees temperature. That's a big difference really quickly. Yeah, it's very fast, you know, and that's part of the thing which propels the core stage and the rest of the SLS uh, off of the Earth's surface. I got to say, you're keeping calm. You've got a, a cool level head right now, but I have to imagine you're excited about this. You've been working on this for years. Yeah, you know, it's, it's an absolute surreal experience, you know, for everyone who's been working on this, you know, for the last few years and even longer than that. You know, I think it's everyone's really excited about the core stage test. Everyone's excited to see it be launched for Artemis 1 and for the future Artemis mission. So um, I know the whole team's working hard. You know, the team in our test control center is working very hard. So, um, you know, I think everyone's just looking forward to it. I do want to talk a little bit more about the team because we see some people here, but it's actually people across the country. Can you talk to us a, a little bit about the different companies that have gone into integrating with NASA here and how all that comes together? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we, we have thousand of, thousands of parts on the rocket, you know, and there's tons of companies and, and subcontractors, you know, small companies, big companies. Um, and so, you know, we have more than, we have, we've had parts from more than 44 states across the nation. Um, and then obviously, you know, our, our Boeing contractor, our lead contractor for the project, you know, they've been working hand in hand with NASA the whole time. Um, those teams have really out, been performing really, really well um, thus far. And then obviously our RS-25 engine supplied by Aerojet Rocketdyne. I mean, you know, all three of our teams have done a really good job of getting to today. Well, Alex, thank you for being in the hot seat, explaining everything to me and to everyone at home. We are actually going to move forward now. We're going to give you a little bit of a break. Feel free to take some water and listen in. We actually would love for you to listen in to the control room so we can come back and ask you uh, exactly what they're talking about. Give us a breakdown. I'm excited now to be talking to an astronaut who is here with us, Tracy Caldwell Dyson. Tracy. 
It's Thanks. so great to meet you. Thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. It's a real honor and a, and a privilege to be here. So yeah, sure. it's going to be exciting. Yeah, sure. Well, first I want to talk to you about uh, the you act the of you. launching off this planet. You have flown on the shuttle, STS-118 specifically, and one of those engines that flew you to space is powering this very core stage. That's pretty cool. That is well, really cool. All right, <laughs> I have to ask you first basic question. What does it feel like to launch? Oh gosh, there's so many feelings. Uh, even before you even get I inside the vehicle, as you're walking up to the launch pad, and you see this mammoth rocket uh, standing before you, and uh, from the sensations to the the things that you see to the things that you realize, you've got a job to do, but yet you're doing this um, incredible. Uh, you're having this incredible experience, uh, from the the light up of the engines to the uh, to the lift off, uh, the the swaying of the rocket, the rumble, the the all of the vibrations, the controlled explosion happening underneath you, to the constant acceleration that you're feeling as you're propelled into orbit, to the, you know, the engines are throttling, all you know is that you're just going fast. And, um, and then you're, you're in there with uh, your, your buddies, um, you've been training all this time, uh, you get to um, the, the solid rocket boosters, as soon as they <laughs> expend their energy and uh, they separate from the vehicle and you're just riding on those main engines, the RS-25s, I remember uh, being so impressed with how smooth and powerful that ride was. It was like riding on rails. And, um, and then of course the moment you get into, uh, into orbit, it's some of the, the most strange tranquility that you've uh, ever experienced in your life. I want to ask you to do something here. If you'll indulge me for a second, let's just take a look back because we are about a mile away from SLS. Well, as you take a look at that, what's going through your mind? You know, I have to I have to give it up for the folks that are in the control room right now because I, you know, I can remember how I felt standing at the at the foot of the rocket before I launched on it. But all of those folks, like Alex was mentioning, that have played a role in this, plus uh, the ones that are um, around the test stand, um, that is their baby. And um, when those when those engines light, there's um, there's a lot of uh, hands and eyes and hearts and soul that are uh, that are in every ounce of thrust that are coming out of those engines. And so I think when I look at that, I just think about all of the people um, who make up the body of that rocket and the thrust that's coming out of it. And I'm really excited for them. <laughs> excited for all of us. Yeah. And it's exciting for all of us here. And what's the difference with the um, excitement in the astronaut community? Oh, goodness. Um, well, I tell you what, there's a whole a lot of other uh, blue flight suit folks that wish that they were here today. Um, we are uh, just genuinely excited about this opportunity to um, to go uh, um, further than low Earth orbit and explore uh, again our moon and uh, to set a foundation um, along with those footprints and uh, to go beyond that and to just be here at this time um, with all this excitement is um, a real privilege, privilege for all of us. Um, but as, as a core of astronauts, um, we're just really excited about um, where we're headed. So. All right, you said moon. So as we progress towards the moon, talk to us about the significance of the human element in space. Why is it so important to put humans back on the moon? Oh, goodness. Um, I think be it's, uh, there's so many ways to answer this, but I think, um, you know, we, we have it inside each one of us to, uh, to, to discover, to explore, to um, let out our creativity. And um, I think the reason it's important for humans, I mean, techni technically it's important because um, we know how to make decisions right then and there, especially with time delays and, and uh, not having a camera view every single place you need to look. It's, uh, I think, vital to have humans involved. But the spirit the, of exploration is within our hearts and uh, there's no other way to live it out but uh, to send our humans um, to these destinations. And there's a lot of people watching today and a lot of kids watching today, young girls watching today. Do you have anything you want to say to them specifically? Oh, goodness. Uh, well, with what time we have left, I would say that um, the most important thing to do is to, uh, is to know what you enjoy doing and start now uh, taking note of those things because what we really want is, um, is the best in you and what brings the best in you out for everyone to see is uh, doing the things that you enjoy and so I would uh, encourage everyone to to go and uh, explore all the <laughs> all the things that you um, are doing right now and ask yourself if um, if you didn't have to uh, 
if you didn't have to get a grade in this, would you still be doing it? Um, and so I just think that it's it's within uh, their reach to um, to fulfill their dreams as long as what they're doing is what they enjoy. Stay curious. Stay curious, absolutely. Well, Tracy, I'm lucky to be with you. We're both lucky to be here right now, but there are a lot of people at home who've got questions for you, too. All Would right. you mind if I asked you some questions off of Twitter? Please do. All right. We're going to jump to uh, a few questions we've gotten in. The first one is from Amber. Amber on Twitter asks, what is the main mission, or what do you hope to learn with these next series of landings? On the moon, I think uh, what we are trying to learn is um, just make sure we know how to get back there, and then to uh, <laughs> to set up uh, to set up our um, our mission so that we can come back. And we and our whole goal is to is to lay a foundation on the moon and make it sustainable so that we can continue to come back. And so I think the most um, the most important thing is uh, is to um, is to test our systems and uh, to make sure that we can uh, duplicate it. So make sure we don't get lost and that That's we know what we're important. doing when we get there. <laughs> okay. That is highly important. That's a great answer. All right, another user on Twitter asks, what would be your final meal before leaving for the moon? Oh, goodness. Ah, what would be my final meal? You know what? I would, I would, this is going to be boring, but I would want a salad. What? Why? Why? Because I want fresh food before <laughs> I go, because the rest of it's going to be all dehydrated, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Do you get queasy on the launch, too? No, uh, I, I didn't, um, and I think part of that's because you are so highly trained and you've got are, a job to do and you're highly focused, um, and uh, with all the G's pressing against you, um, it kind of keeps your stomach still. <laughs> it's keeping it down. <laughs> Keep okay. there. One last question for you. What is the coolest thing you've experienced being an astronaut? Oh, i got to say that it is um, being in uh, shorts and a T-shirt, Living on board the space station, looking out the window and gazing at this beautiful planet. That that probably is the most exciting, coolest thing I've ever done as an astronaut. Well, Tracy, thank you so much for being here. I hope My you pleasure. get to enjoy the show. And uh, thank you to everyone watching and submitting questions online. What we're going to do right now is we are just going to watch with you. We're going to take a step back. We are going to watch the test stand, and we're going to listen in. And we are going to ask Alex to uh, please pay extra special attention because we're going to come back and ask you what's going on in the control room. So again, we are going to take a step back and I'll just watch the test stand for just a few minutes.
And a reminder, we are in a dynamic situation. The teams are in a hold right now. We are still well within our window for today's test. The teams are working towards getting an updated test time for today. So we have Alex with us. And Alex, um, we were listening into a little bit of the control room audio. What does it mean that we're in a hold and what were you hearing from the control room? Right, so right now we're still in a stable replenish. And basically what that means is we're still getting fuel into the tanks from the facility. And the replenish cycle is kind of meant to maintain uh, topping off the tanks to their full capacity as some of that liquid does turn back to gas and we've been off that gas. So we are in a stable replenish phase. Um, obviously, some, some of our engineers in the test control center are seeing some data that they don't like or might be um, not exactly normal for what they usually see. Um, so those teams are off now kind of having sidebar conversations with each other to kind of determine what we need to do to go forward. So I want to go back because all this might be obvious to you, but we're trying to figure out where we are in this whole process. We thought, you know, we might just come here and see the engines light up, but that's not what happens. So what happened up until this point and what are we waiting on now? Right. So like we said, you know, we, we, we powered on the vehicle right over the last few days. You know, we've we've repaired all the systems. We've tested all the systems. Um, and then this morning we started tanking, you know, by uh, filling both our liquid hydrogen and our liquid oxygen tanks um, with propellant. And so that's really been the long process today. I mean, obviously we have to chill down our uh, main propulsion system, so all of our mechanical parts uh, have to be chilled down to a certain temperature um, before we do uh, hot fire as well. So, you know, right now they're obviously working through some, salt, some, some issues in that process, um, you know, and as we learn more, as they learn more, we'll learn more. Um, and so whenever we do hear audio, uh, we'll be able to give a better update. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that process? We're talking about chilling down the engines themselves? Right, and yeah, all the engines and all the components inside the engine section, which holds the engines, uh, have to be chilled down to a certain temperature before you uh, start the actual hot fire, the ignition of the engines. Um, and that's just because they're, you know, they're meant to operate under those cold cryo cryogenic temperatures. Um, and then obviously when you're hot firing the engines, you start to heat up those parts, right? So you want to cool them down to a certain, to a certain point, and then obviously you'll heat them back up uh, whenever you're firing the engines. So say this hold is lifted, um, what will happen next? So if, if, when we do, or when they talk about the hold and they lift it to continue operations, you know, we'll, from that point, we're at the point where we'll start to move into our T minus 10 minute countdown. Um, and, and that cu countdown kind of moves into our final sequence of activities uh, to finalize right before we get to the actual hot fire. So there's a whole set of activities we get um, every few minutes and that'll kind of determine um, I, what time we will fire and then that we are actually going to fire. Will we be able to see anything during that T minus 10 countdown or really not see anything until the last second? Yeah, you'll probably see a few things and it's a few of those things you might be able to see right now. Um, the water suppression system is operating. It's not operating at 100% right now because we're obviously not hot firing the engines. Um, but when we do, you'll be pumping 100,000 gallons of water every 20 seconds. Um, you know, you'll, you'll be able to see, obviously, uh, some of the engines gimbal, which are moving in a few degrees in different directions. Um, and that'll be part of the, the run up until we actually do activate each engine. And you've told me this before off stage, but I thought this was fascinating. So we haven't had a test like this since the Apollo era. And there was something that happened then with a giant plume that actually made it start raining on everyone out here. Can you tell us that story? Yeah, absolutely. A lot of people don't realize is, no, we have our two propellants, our liquid hydrogen and our liquid oxygen. Um, you know, and when you react with those two chemicals, you know, you're really just creating H2O. So you're, you're, when you see the big plume coming out, it's just water vapor, right? And, you know, since when we tested Apollo, you know, back during the um, Saturn V program, you know, that the amount of water vapor coming out during that test is, is quite breathtaking and also it's so much that it can create clouds and sometimes rain clouds so sometimes you can get rained on from that all right so we can expect possible rain even though it's a yeah. beautiful uh, cold but sunny day today what else can we expect to see right so you'll hear the test conductor audio um, when we get into our t minus 10 minute countdown so after that you'll, you'll hear you know every few minutes him come on come on the phone and say hey we're you know we're getting to this step and then you'll hear the engines rev up for the hot fire. Well, Alex, thank you so much. We are going to remain live. I might be coming back to you in a minute.
in 10 minutes, but we are really excited to have you here explaining everything to us. And a reminder to everyone at home, this is a live test. We are still listening in for the control room teams as they review the data of the test up to this point. They are having a conversation right now about the appropriate steps to move forward. So Alex, um, we've had a little bit of a talk about those discussions. Again, we're gonna be coming back and forth to you. Um, and again, a note to our viewers, we're going to be hearing calls from the test conductor at regular intervals over the next 10 minutes or, or possibly more. When we hear those call outs, what we're gonna do is we're gonna pause and listen in. I might turn to Alex and, and have you explain them to us again. Um, for right now, what we're gonna do is pause and listen for some of those so we can try to catch up with the rest of you and everyone in the control room, find out what's going on and just take a step back and look at the beautiful SLS on the test stand now. Help ourselves kind of keep it down in the control room, please. We are coming up on the, another event here in the uh, terminal countdown timeline, coming up on about two, minus 40 minutes or in about two minutes.
right, all personnel, we're pick, going to be picking up on page uh, 3.27, where uh, the team is 40-minute uh, time mark and event. Step 4.61, SCE, let's go ahead and initiate the terminal count sequencer IOC for sub-step alpha. Let's go ahead and enable TCC user underscore hold. Let me know when that's enabled. User hold enabled in green. Copy, and then please enable STCTR48, please. The station control terminal countdown engine anomaly, if not already enabled. Uh, STCTR48 enabled in green. Copy that. Takes us to step 4.62 sequencer. Let's go ahead and perform the stage control terminal count sequencer setup as follows. Please ensure the countdown timer is open. CD2 window is open. And ensure your display test commit criteria is also open. Uh, TCC display is also open. Copy. And we're going to go to sub-step Charlie. Uh, if you would, verify on the terminal count sequence or that the IOC has been initiated. Uh, verify and initialization was successful. Copy. And verify engine configuration is hot fire. Engine configuration is hot fire. And verify display configuration is hot fire. Display configuration is also hot fire. For sub-step four, please record the version of the GLS events table being used for today. Okay, version hot fire, version R98, rev 8. Did you copy that, BQA1? No, sir. Engine configuration being used today is hot fire, version R98, rev 8. Version hot fire, R98, rev 8. Correct, Rev Alpha. Copy, it takes the top of the tree. Hey, that Alpha, right? Hot Fire R98, Rev A, copy. Okay, that takes us to the top of page 328 for step step five. Verify that the engine configuration is the desired version of the GLS events table that you just uh, mentioned. Confirm. And verify the display configuration is also the desired version of the GLS, GLS events table. Also confirmed. Okay, under your TCS engine status, verify activate sequencer is selected and displayed. TCS engine status activated. Uh, I copy that. Okay, for the note there, TCS will automatically stop at the um, TMI's 10 minute hold point. HEA, if you're on 16, step 4.63 is yours. Copy that. NTC is HEA in 16. Give him a second. Here's coming to 16. Go for NTC. NTC, can you please verify and or perform a helium spin start panel activation per DOP 11 to provide 1,000 to 1,300 PSIG to the CAPUs? Roger that. It is set up. Copy that. It is complete. Record a UTC on that of 016-21-17-07. Copy 016-21-17-07. Copy that the NTC. The next step is yours per step 4.64, please. Roger that. And uh, NBTC, let's go ahead and prepare this, the deflector for test configuration. And he's on the phone, but he's been coordinating with the water plant, and he'll get uh, the bypasses open in just a moment. Copy that. And then NTC, per our discussion, we will uh, keep the main, we will maintain the current uh, timeline and the current countdown time per our discussion. Roger that. Sounds good.
You are watching NASA's Green Run Hot Fire Test here at Stennis Space Center. The teams are in a hold, but we are still well within our window for today's test still, and I am lucky to have Alex here with me. We've heard a lot of conversations from the control room over the past few minutes. I heard hot fire a lot. I heard water a few times. You're the expert. What were you hearing? So um, the test conductor instructed everyone to go back into our terminal countdown sequence. Um, and so at this point, we are about 30 minutes away from the hot fire according to the terminal countdown sequence. Um, some of the other things they're kind of talking about, um, they're, they're turning on the water deflectors, right, for the engine test. So there's certain configurations that we need to put each um, thing on the stand or, or thing on the ground uh, in a certain configuration for that hot fire. So um, they're, you know, they're supplying certain amount of pressure to different components inside the engine section and like we said turning on those water deflectors um, retracting some of the stands around those engines really to prepare the stand and the um, core stage for hot fire we heard at least two people talking is that right what were those people uh, or what are those positions back there right so the test conductor is basically relaying information to individuals working a console and each of those console um, workers are either going through test criteria, right? So we have test commit criteria um, for each part of the test. You know, they're looking at different things that are happening with the stand. They may be controlling the water going onto the stand. So um, he is in direct communication with each person that is working each individual component on the stand. So you'll hear him giving out a lot of commands of things that need to go according to our countdown sequence. And where are they? They're even closer than we are, right? And they're in a safe place, I hope. Right, absolutely. They're in a, a, test, a test control center. Um, closer to the stand, um, and that stand um, is wired, has wires running all the way to the test control center, um, and, and in the test control center they can see everything going on, they can see all the cameras, um, and they're each sitting at console, you know, be able to make decisions real time, so, you know, they're sitting in a, in, in a, in a building, it's fully blast proof, right, it has giant blast doors closed in there, so, um, you know, the team's working really hard, you know, there's a lot of people in there looking at a lot of stuff, um, so, you know, they're obviously working through it, and, uh, working towards hot fire. And those two people we heard, are they sitting close to each other? Are they hearing each other kind of like we're hearing them now? So the test conductor audio, um, you know, he's, he's, in, he's in one part inside the test control room. So, you know, he's, he's talking on a, a, in a regular voice kind of like we are. Um, and then he could be communicating with someone on the far end of the room or he could be communicating with someone sitting right next to him, but that's all over the audio kind of like we're hearing. So is this considered normal when you think about testing a rocket? Yeah, absolutely. You know, that there's a ton of people um, who play a part in the actual test of a rocket or in the launch of a rocket, right? So you have to have a proper way of communicating, um, proper one-way or two-way channels um, so that the correct people can be heard at the correct time. So um, everything that's happening is, you know, is obviously planned as far as, you know, communication and working through issues. Um, and then now that we're in our close to 30-minute terminal countdown, we'll be hearing a, a lot more things over the radio. And we heard about this window. So there's a certain amount of time that they have to be able to light these engines. It's not like a launch window where we're trying to reach the moon, so we have to pay attention to that. But what does this window mean? So, you know, there's there, there's certain operating um, guidelines that we have for, for certain things in the engine. You know, there's certain times that we can have avionics um, boxes powered on, and there's certain times that we're allowed to have the batteries running on internal power, things like that. Um, obviously, while the core stage is integrated to the stand, we have a little more leeway because the stand is supplying a lot of that power, or supplying a lot of, you know, the materials we need to continue testing. Um, you know, it, it's going to be more of a process for them to determine uh, what the next step forward is for testing. I um, mean, I'm sure it's something we'll hear over the test conductor audio. Okay, I'm going to be coming back to you a lot more. Again, uh, we're going to keep you in the hot seat here, even though it's cold outside. We're all excited for the, the big hot blast um, coming in, I think you said about 30 minutes is yep. what, what we're expecting. So again, what we're going to do, a reminder, this is a live test. We're still listening in for the control room teams as they're reviewing this data as we're leading up to the test point. They're still having a conversation right now about the appropriate steps to move forward. So again, we're going to join you. We're going to take a step back and just watch. We're going to look at the test stand and listen in for the control center. We're going to let Alex digest it all for us, and we'll come back to you in just a few minutes.
And you are watching NASA's Green Run Hot Fire Test here at Stennis Space Center. The teams are in a hold, but we are still well within our window for today's test. And we did just get an update. And so we've got our expert here, Alex, a core stage engineer. Alex, what did we just hear from the control room? So our test conductor is kind of discussing um, a path forward, obviously, with our test. Um, right now, we're about the T minus 10 minute mark. So we're in a holding pattern for that T minus 10. Um, they're going to go around and continue to monitor our fuel levels, you know, our propellant, how much propellant we have, um, not only in the core stage itself, but also we have on reserve. Um, and then over the next 10 to 15 minutes, they'll kind of have a discussion um, about, you know, our propellant reserves, um, the path forward, and whether we're going to go into that T minus 10 minute countdown sequence. Okay, so we heard about one hold earlier when we started taking our pauses and listening in. This sounds like we're in a different hold, is that right? Right, so the T minus 10 hold is, is really the last major milestone before we get into a lot of the major operations that we use. Um, to get into the actual hot fire. So, you know, starting at the T minus 10 mark, we every minute we have a lot of um, very important tasks that we'll be doing um, up until hot fire. Okay, so let's walk through those. What else will we expect to hear once we hit T minus 10? And then what are some of the calls we can expect to listen in on and expect um, going forward? Right, so once we start T minus 10 count, um, we'll have a lot of software that gets initiated to, to start the, the hot fire, right? And some of that's autom automated, some of it's not. Um, you know, we'll move into activation of some of our major propulsion components. Um, we'll, we'll turn on our capus um, at about the four minute mark and those are used to kind of steer our engines with our hydraulic system. Um, from there, we'll start certain uh, purges inside the engine section and then we'll move into internal power within the rocket. So it's fully powering itself um, and then we'll start the engine sequence. And a reminder, this is a live show. We are listening into the control room. It's very important that Alex doesn't just keep talking, giving us interesting answers the whole time because he needs to listen in to be able to digest what we're hearing so uh, he can tell us what's going on and we can get more of an update. So we're going to do that now. We're gonna take another pause. We're gonna sit back with you just like you are at home and we're going to watch the test stand. We're gonna have Alex listen into the control room so we can come back and find out when we can watch the uh, SLS core stage hot fire test. We'll be right back.
And if you've been with us since the top of the show, you've heard me say this a few times, but we are so happy you're still here with us. You are watching NASA's Green Run Hot Fire Test here at Stennis Space Center in Mississippi. The teams are still in a hold, and we are still within today's window for the test. We do have an update, so I'm excited again to have Alex Cagnola here with us. Alex, what's happening right now? So right now our teams are still kind of doing some preps before we move into our T-minus 10-minute count. Um, there's a lot of just individual preps you have to do on the stand, um, individual components. You know, certain configurations we have to put everything in before we actually do perform that hot fire. Um, you know, they're going around, they're polling uh, all of our program management and our and our chief engineers to see, um, you know, it, uh, you know, are we good to go on? You know, or we need to move on? Um, you know, we're also monitoring other things. You know, we're monitoring how much propellant we have in the tanks, how much propellant we have um, on reserve on the barges to to use for the hot fire. Um, and then just as we work through those issues, we'll hear more information uh, as we get closer. So you said monitoring how much propellant we have on the tanks. Why is that important at this step? Right, so this whole time before we go into hot fire, we're in a phase called replenish phase. And I know we kind of talked about that, but, um, you know, that fuel is very, very cold. And, you know, in the outside right now, it's not as cold, right? Um, and so, you know, constantly that fuel is being converted into gas and then vented out of the tanks. And then so, so the entire time we're in a phase called replenish where we're constantly pumping a little bit of fuel back into the tanks to make sure it's at max capacity. And we've said at the beginning of this show that this hot fire test can last up to eight minutes. What I understand is we can learn a lot in just the first few minutes. Is that right? Right. You know, a lot of the engineering data we're looking to get um, really comes in the first 250 seconds. So, you know, whenever we do initiate hot fire, you know, we're going to be gimbling our engines a little bit, right? So we'll be moving the engines in a, in a certain pattern that will kind of mirror what we might expect during launch. Um, you know, we'll be throttling down the engines for a while, and then we might throttle them back up. You know, there's, there's a lot of things that we're going to try out, and most of those things will be in the first 250 seconds. Obviously, we want to go for the full eight minutes that we will see during launch, um, but, you know, I think that we'll get a lot of really useful data in those first few minutes. So you said gimbling the engines, moving them a little bit. It's not like a, a NASCAR turn or anything like that. We'll be seeing the engines, right? Just small movements? Yeah, it's very, very small movements, and you might not even notice. You know, it's only a, f a few degrees in each way, you know, and you might see a couple of them move at the same time or you might not, um, but that few degrees can, can really change your trajectory of your rocket when you do launch it. So it's important to be able to test that uh, here at Stennis um, while we're hot firing and not just when the engines are just sitting there, right? It's a lot different when you have all that thrust coming out the bottom of the rocket um, than it is just testing it without it. So I'd love for you to take a second with me and just take a look back. We can see a little bit of white steam, smoke coming out. Can you describe that for us? Right, so um, what you're kind of seeing right now is the uh, max deflectors, um, the water deflectors on the flame ramp, right? So we kind of talked about how much water they're pumping, you know, 110,000 gallons every 20 minutes or so. Um, so it's a lot, you know, it's a lot of water coming out, um, you know, and roughly 32,000 holes on that flame ramp that are all pumping water. So, um, you know, obviously you're going to see a lot of mist before the hot fire. Um, and they'll actually even increase the amount of water coming up when we do get closer as well. And those are called flame buckets, am I right? Yeah, that's right. It's a flame bucket. Um, you know, you, you might even see some flame coming out of there whenever we do light up all four engines. So it'll be very exciting. Um, you know, and, and, you know, obviously all the safety systems are in place to um, take care of that when we do do hot fire. Okay, and again, we are still in a hold. In some way, this is a planned hold. We've got different versions of holds throughout the test. Uh, and as we get more information, we're going to come back. Uh, we still have Alex here with us. I'm not going to let him leave. You're going to stay mic'd into your chair right here because we want your expertise on what's going on. And as soon as we have more information from the control room, we're going to come right back to you. For now, we are going to take a step back and look at the test stand just like you are at home. And we'll be back in a few minutes.
We've got our most exciting update uh, in a few minutes. We are now inside terminal count. And again, I'm not the expert here. We've got Alex Cagnola with us who's going to explain what that means and how did we get to this point. Right, so the test conductor just came on the audio and, alert, and, on the audio and alerted us that we're about nine minutes away, actually. So um, we'll be getting some pretty regular updates here. Um, you know, we be, we'll be hearing some activation of some different components on the rocket before the hot fire. Um, and obviously there's a lot of steps that we'll be hearing um, going into the actual hot fire with things like, like we talked about, CAPU act activation, you know, move to internal power. Um, you know, if there's any kind of audio that might slow down the terminal count, they'll kind of come on the air and tell us that too. Um, but right now we are in that final sequence that lasts, you know, eight and a half to eight minutes. Um, so we're going to sit back and kind of listen for the updates from the test conductor. And this wasn't one person's yeah, right, decision. This minutes. is a full group that has to make the decision that we are ready to keep going. Right. Every big Hold decision. Hold on one second. What I do want to remind everyone now is that you're actually able to hear the control room audio just like we are. So what we're going to try to do um, is when the test conductor starts talking, I'm going to rudely cut Alex off in the middle of what he's talking about and try to make sure that we can all listen in, give him enough time to understand that call. So uh, we just missed one. Again, this is a live show. But I want to get back to how we got to this decision. And again, it's not just one person. Right. You know, that goes back to, you know, we have a great team working. Um, all the engineering issues, you know, and then obviously, you know, they kind of come up with a story about what's going on and they present that in the best way possible to our program management and to, you know, those who, who are the big decision makers. And so every time we have a big milestone like this, we have to pull the whole board, you know, everyone brings up their concerns um, or if they think, you know, going forward, what they think um, and then do a, a go, no go poll. And, and it sounds like everyone minutes. was a go. Um, so we're moving Mark. forward in terminal count. Okay, and again, you can hear some of that test conductor audio. I'm sure you couldn't hear that one because you were talking, giving us a great <laughs> explanation. But now I do want to know, so um, in, within these 10 minutes, we're now about seven minutes, I understand. What are we expecting to hear from the test conductor? Right, you'll, you'll hear a test conductor um, say a few things, things like um, initiate purge start. And that purge will be a nitrogen gas purge inside the engine section. Um, that's part of just a normal sequence of, of purging the whole area around the engines before you initi initiate hot fire. Um, you'll hear move to internal power. That's a big one. We'll take all the now all the boxes and all the batteries, everything on board. The core stage will be powering itself, almost like you would have during launch. Um, and then you'll move into AOS start, which is our pre-ignition engine start, um, and that'll be right before, 30 seconds before T0, where we'll power up the engines. Okay, so we're and about... Six minutes on my mark. We just heard about six minutes, was that six, right? That is six minutes away, so they're going to start really um, having a lot more calls on the audio. We're going to hear, we might even hear some things being turned on inside inside the core stage. So, um, you know, obviously we'll start talking less as we hear more audio comes through. Okay, sure. What will those things sound like? Uh, so you'll hear TCC, you know, um, you know, more and more calls. They'll be talking to more in the control room with individuals. They'll be talking to people. Go yeah, sir. Looks like somebody over to interpret with the TCS window. Yeah, nobody else should have the TCS GUI. If you have it open, please close it at this time. So, right, they're just working through some small things between all the monitors. You know, they're, they're opening and closing certain things that need to be closed inside the rocket, you know, from the stand. Um, you know, they're going to completely secure the stand with everything that needs to be done before the hot fire. And really, it's just the final preps before we do um, initiate engine start. Okay, again, you are all hearing what we're hearing. We're pausing whenever the test conductor is speaking or other people uh, in the control center are speaking because we're trying to learn and what's happening to the rocket. On my mark. It sounds like about five minutes away on Monster their right. mark. Again, remind us who's the one in our ear. What's that role? So that's our Green Run test conductor, and he's kind of been um, the one in control of all the Green Run test cases, not just this one leading up to this point. So he has a great working relationship um, with all those that are on the test team. And so, um, obviously, right now we're in T minus five minutes. Um, you know, so there'll be a lot of activation going up until we do hot fire. So, you know, like we said, Capu spin up. Um, you know, move to internal power, purge sequence, and then we'll move into engine, engine hey, activation. It's all going to come pretty quick. I'm going to pause you for a second. Uh, TCC violation. We're holding at T minus four minutes forty-six. Can I copy that? BTD DEA. It's the Delta P sensors. Okay. Copy that, and we'll um, wait till we get to the uh, hold at uh, T minus uh, 440. Yeah, We're in the hold set. We're in the go, and if you want to go ahead and use that pre plan. DLH, let's uh, go to manual mode and try to dial in the lead delta B, please. 
if this is the right time. Can you break down what we just heard? So they're moving into some, some final sequencing. Um, obviously, you can see um, on the flame bucket, they've now initiated max water flow into that flame bucket, so you'll be seeing yeah, a lot more mess coming reminder, from that We do bucket. have two minutes, 35 seconds uh, for the hold, so. Like so we are two minutes, 35 seconds on the, on the, before the one minute and 40 hold, from what I understand. Um, so obviously that one minute, 40 hold will be We're the last minute, little bit. The timer. Um, before we do start uh, start up the engine, so it's very exciting. <laughs> You're yeah. getting excited. Yeah, I can absolutely. hear everyone around us getting excited. This is great. And what we're going to make sure we do is we have to make sure we're all being safe to, here. Uh, reset that whenever you get ready. We are at uh, one minute and 30 seconds in the whole timer. Okay, if you're in the band, go ahead and reset MPS 17, please. So we're going to go ahead and take a step back. We're going to put our ear protection on. Uh, so we'll be moving into internal power. Um, and again, putting our ear protection on, listening in from here on out, and observing this major milestone on America's return to the moon with Artemis. Sequencer. Sequencer activated. Resume and count on my mark. Three, two, one, mark. Now we're counting down. The sequencer is counting. Coming up on T-minus four minutes on my mark. Mark. And T minus three minutes on my mark. Mark. Coming up in T-minus two minutes on my mark. Mark. Come on, on T minus one thirty. Mark. Coming up in two minus one minute on my mark. Mark.
Colonel all personnel report that you're ready to go. PEA. Go. AEA. HEA. Go. REA. Go. NTC. We're go. All right, we're in ALS. And we're in the press count. Engine start. We're in the press count. Call for South Fleet. Continue to monitor your system. And uh, the rest is in control. Personnel, it's going to be post hot fire, post hot fire or shutdown securing operations in page uh, 656. BTD, I need you to verify with the engine guy. Yeah, sorry about that. Standby. Yeah, the all personnel, that does take us to the last page there on page uh, 632. AR1, if you wouldn't step 4.241, please verify. Of course, the engine 1s and 4 have uh, shut down for that step, and we have a safe engine shutdown. We are in post shutdown standby, engines 1 through 4. We just saw the core stage of SLS fire up. Of course, we also heard some uh, test conductor come in, so we want to go straight to Alex. Alex, can you please describe to us, first of all, what we saw and then what we heard? Yeah, absolutely. Um, obviously, we had a very successful initiation of the engines. Um, you know, our, the beginning of our thrust profile there when we were firing for the first minute or so, um, you know, we obviously were getting some really good data coming through. Um, you know, but like we said earlier, you know, this, this is a test. You know, we have test commit criteria and we have certain boundaries that we have to keep all the oper all the operations under. So, you know, we really are trying to make sure that, you know, everything's operating properly and safely. So, you know, the test team was kind of seeing some data that they might not like. Um, and so obviously, you know, our engines were shut down ahead of the eight minute scheduled time frame. But we do have a lot of good data to go look at. Um, and hopefully, you know, we can move on from here and maybe get it, you know, see what's going to go on further. So I was looking at your face when that started lighting up, and that was incredible. We saw the cloud forming. We both saw rainbows yeah. just forming right over our side. Just how did it feel in those first few seconds? Yeah, it's amazing. You know, it never really gets old, that feeling that you get, you know, in your chest or, you know, seeing, you know, just how powerful those rockets are when they're testing. So. 
um, obviously, you know, it was an awesome thing to see, you know, and, uh, you know, I can't wait to get the core stage to Kennedy and uh, get ready for launch. And you told us, you know, over eight minutes we might have had tons and tons, terabytes worth of data, but we already have data just from right now. What are they going to do with that right away? Right, and so just like all of our other green run tests, you know, our, we have teams that are going to go and break down that data. Uh, and, and kind of see what we're seeing in our profiles, right? And so, I mean, that all goes into the, you know, the, the profile that we'll use for launch eventually at Kennedy. So, I mean, obviously there's a lot of things looking at the data. You know, we kind of talked about, you know, over the span of our green run testing, we have roughly 800 uh, terabytes of data, and that's a lot of data. You know, we're talking about, it's it's, it's hard to grasp how much data that is. So, you know, the, we'll, we'll obviously take the time to dig through everything, um, and then obviously uh, have a path forward from there. And I know it happened really fast, but can you tell us what the people were talking about that we could hear from uh, the test conductor in that audio? Right. So after we did uh, engine initiation, you know, they're kind of going through and monitoring everything, right? So obviously, once we are actually firing the engines, we have to look at you know all of our um, engine re engine readings when that comes to temperatures, you know how they're reacting, how they're moving, and all that stuff. Um, we were just getting into our gimbal profiling test, which is you know moving the engines around. Um, right before we, we terminated the hot fire. So um, we're obviously going to have a lot of good data to look at. Great. Thank you, Alex. I'm so glad you're here. And so as the engineers gather data from today, we look ahead to the next steps. This core stage will be lifted out of the B2 test stand and refurbished to patch up that orange foam insulation. Then the team will load it onto our Pegasus barge, about as long as a football field, to make a six-day journey from the Gulf of Mexico to our Kennedy Space Center on Florida's Atlantic coast. There, it will be stacked in the iconic vehicle assembly building with other elements of the SLS rocket, including the twin solid rocket boosters, which our teams have already begun stacking on the mobile launcher. The core stage will join the boosters and then be stacked with the upper stage. And then the Orion spacecraft with the launch abort system on top. All of this work putting us on track to roll out to launch pad 39B for a liftoff later this year on Artemis 1. We are going to pause again and just talk about what we just experienced the stage was rattling that we're on here. We saw everybody with their phones out who's able to be here today. Um, talk us through from right when the engine started, what did we just see? Right, so you kind of, those last minute and a half, right, you're kind of hearing the test conductor talk about, you know, move to internal power. Um, all go for ALS startup, which is engine startup, right? And then at T-minus zero, you heard the final count where they're kind of pulling all the people who are really watching the critical components of the rock, you know, those critical readings we need right before we initiate engine start. Um, so after, you know, everyone kind of gave their go, we initiate engine start, obviously. Um, and that ALS, you kind of saw the pre-burners going on that rock. You kind of see some of the sparks flowing, right? And that's all part of the, part of the test. Uh, and then right before they start flowing, um, that fuel and that mixture and then it ignites and you see it at T-minus zero. So that's kind of what we were seeing running up to the test. And then uh, after that, you obviously saw the plume and then the rest of the test as well. And we saw a few different angles. We were up really close to the engines. How are yeah. we able to see that? Well, obviously we have, you know, the cameras and um, all of our views on the standard, you know, obviously well-engineered cameras, you know, very protective casings and all that. You know, it's all important that we not only get the data, but all the video and, and the view of what, of what exactly is going on. Great. Well, thank you again. We may still come back to you, but I want to remind everyone, it's not just Artemis 1. We've got several firsts on the horizon. This year, the first of our commercial lunar payload services, or CLIPS missions, begin with two companies delivering instruments to the lunar surface. The golf cart-sized Viper rover will search for water at the moon's south pole. A small CubeSat called Capstone will head to the moon scouting the orbit to be used on later human missions. And Artemis 1 launches on an uncrewed flight to test both SLS and Orion on a journey beyond the moon and back to Earth. Later on, we'll be launching the Power and Propulsion Element, or PPE, and the Habitation and Logistics Outpost, or HALO, to lunar orbit to become the first pieces of our lunar gateway, which will provide the jumping off point for lunar missions. Artemis II will be a 10-day crewed test flight where astronauts will set a new record for farthest distance traveled from Earth. And finally, Artemis III in 2024. 
The hardware for those next two Artemis missions is coming together right now at Mishu. The Boeing team is already demonstrating faster manufacturing times by implementing all the experiences and lessons from the building the first core stage. In Utah, Northrop Grumman is already building the booster segments for the next several missions as well. We've also got the Orion spacecraft for Artemis II down at Kennedy undergoing assembly. And the spacecraft for Artemis III is also being manufactured right now at Mishu in our hometown of New Orleans. So that wraps it up for us here today. After a major milestone on America's return of astronauts to the lunar surface, a successful test of the core stage of the Space Launch System rocket. Up next, we'll be replaying the test, and we will have a post-test briefing in about two hours on NASA television. We invite you to follow all of our progress online at nasa.gov slash Artemis program, or join the conversation online with at NASA Artemis and at NASA underscore SLS. Thank you so much, Alex, for being with here and being our expert tonight. Thank you to the administrator, Jim Bridenstein, and astronaut Tracy Caldwell-Dyson, and most of all, Thank you for joining us, and go Artemis.